Okay, so good. So good. So good. Welcome, everyone, uh, who will be watching this video at a future time. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, the Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi in this discussion with uh, the Clear Mountain Monastery crew, that's myself, Ajahn Kovilo, and Tan Nisabo. And we just have this great opportunity to have Bhikkhu Bodhi here, and I'll just read a, a quick introduction for anyone who doesn't know uh, the Venerable. So, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi is an American Buddhist monk from New York City. After obtaining a BA in philosophy from Brooklyn College in 1966, and a PhD in philosophy from Claremont Graduate School in 1972, uh, he traveled to Sri Lanka where he received successive ordinations in 72 and 73. For many years, he served as the president and editor of the Buddhist Publication Society in Sri Lanka. In addition to numerous essays on a broad range of Buddhist topics, Bhikkhu Bodhi has worked as the editor, compiler, and translator of three of the five main discourse collections of the Pali Canon, that is Majjhima, Sutta, and Anguttara Nikayas, along with the Sutta Nipata and the Nidesas. In 2001, Bhikkhu Bodhi returned to the US and in 2008, together with several of his students, founded the Buddhist Global Relief, a nonprofit supporting hunger relief, sustainable agriculture, and education in countries suffering from chronic poverty and malnutrition. Bodhi is currently resident at Chuan Yen Monastery in Carmel, New York, where he continues to teach and translate. Yes, thank you, Venerable, for agreeing to have this conversation with us. Um, our broad topic will be Buddhist monasticism in America. And uh, start off with, I uh, was just curious, uh, when you were first struck with the, the image of the, the monastic, uh, when you first were taken up with this, uh, this idea of, of being a Buddhist monk or uh, mm. yeah, when you were first inspired by that? So that is the question. That's the question, yeah. I think when I first began to read about Buddhism, it just seemed that if you really wanted to take it seriously, seriously and to pursue it full time, the way to do so is by becoming a monk. Um, this is not to say that lay people can't pursue the Dhamma seriously, but if one wants to do it full time, I thought the natural way to do that is by becoming a monk. And then I just felt this sort of natural draw towards a, I don't know, a life of full time dedication to the practice of the Buddhist path. And that would have been in the early 70s or late 60s? Well, the way this sort of happened, like I became interested in Buddhism maybe my junior year in college, junior and senior year in college. And then an interesting thing happened that I wrote about. This was during the summer between my junior and senior year in college. I was traveling from New York to California to visit some friends who had gone to California for the summer. And I was in a, I got a ride with some people from Brooklyn College who were going, also going to California. And after driving the first day, the first night, we stopped at Madison, Wisconsin, where they had the people who had, had the car, they had had some friends living in Madison. And so we spent the night there. And then the next morning, I got up and just went out for a walk. And before long, I found myself on the campus of the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And then out of the corner of my field of vision, I saw the door of a building opened up and then there came walking, stepping out from the building, a short man with East Asian features wearing a reddish orange robe, like this cut. 
And then he was accompanied by a taller man with white Caucasian man. And they walked across the campus chatting. And at that time, I had already started to read about Buddhism. And so I could immediately recognize that man as a Buddhist monk. And that imprint, imprinted on my mind the image of a Buddhist monk. <laughs> mm. Okay, then after I graduated from college, then I went to graduate school in California. And the second semester that I, and I was living in the graduate residence hall of the, of, the, of the graduate school. And the second semester that I was there, a Buddhist monk from Vietnam came to study at the same university. And he came from the Vietnamese Mahayana tradition. And since I've, I've tried on my own a few times to do meditation, but I thought that you just sit and close your eyes and then immediately you should go into like deep states of absorption and it didn't happen in my case. So I thought I would get some instruction. So I went to this Vietnamese monk and he gave me some instruction. And then I started to practice under his guidance. And sometimes I would go to his room and get some instruction and broader instruction in Buddhism from him. And then the idea came into my mind after a few months that I wanted to become a monk as well. And so then I became ordained as a novice within the Vietnamese system. But then what happened about a year later, he told me that this well-known monk from Vietnam would be coming to the United States on a visit. And this monk had written a, he had done a PhD in India at the Nalanda Buddhist Institute in India. And he was the co-founder of the Van Hein Buddhist University in Vietnam. And he had written a book, which is a comparative study of the Pali Majjhima Nikaya and the Chinese Majjhima Agama. And he said the monk would be coming to Los Angeles and he was planning to go to visit him. And he invited me to come along with him. And so we went to Los Angeles together and this visiting monk was staying at the home of a lay family. And so we came to the house of that family. And then we arrived, they called the distinguished monk to come out from his room. And when he came out, I saw that is the same monk that I saw walking across the <laughs> University of Wisconsin about two years earlier. <laughs> yeah, I, I sort of at first, I had a little hesitation. Could it be the same? Maybe not. Um, but then I waited. You know, first they were speaking in Vietnamese, so I just waited patiently till the conversation hit a pause. Then I came up to that monk and I said, "Is there any chance that you could have been on the campus of the University of Wisconsin in the about July, late July or August, nineteen sixty-five?" He said, yes, in fact, I was. He said that he had a friend named Professor Richard Robinson, who was setting up a program in Buddhist studies at the University of Wisconsin. And he had invited me, that, that's the monk speaking, to come there. And so. So you mentioned Pretty much just when you started reading books about Buddhism, you, you just kept seeing this, this role of the, the monk reappearing in their books. I'm curious, um, like for me, myself and other monks in, in our generation, um, so many of the books that we were inspired by, you know, were actually translated by you. Were there other, were you able to find books from the Pali Canon or were you mostly reading um, books from the Mahayana or Tibetan tradition at that time? Yeah, not Tibetan, the set of the books that were available, readily available at that time were works by Aditi Suzuki, who I don't know if he's so well known now, but back in the 1950s, 1960s, like he was considered like the authority on Zen Buddhism. Though in recent years, his writings have been subject to rather strong critiques that he was sort of deliberately sort of accommodating 
Zen Buddhism to the expectations, the worldview, the outlook of people in the West that he was trying to reach. But in those days, everybody was taking him to be like the international authority on Zen Buddhism. So it was the works of Suzuki, who didn't put, I mean, he didn't emphasize so much monastic life, but whenever he would be relating the stories about these encounters of Zen with the Zen master, it'd always be a monk came up to the Zen master and asked this question. And then the Zen master would give either some apparently irrational answer or hit the monk over the head, something like that. Um, and then there were the writings of, there was an Anglo-American sort of interpreter of Zen to the West named Alan Watts, who is also like his knowledge of Zen Buddhism came through the writings of Suzuki. So th those were the main books were available, but I also had a, a little book called it was a series of paperbacks published on the different religions of the world. And there was a volume on Buddhism called The Teachings of the Compassionate Buddha, edited by one, I think his name was E. A. Burt. He was a professor of philosophy, maybe at Cornell University. But it was an anthology of texts which included some suttas from the Pali Canon, I guess they would have been selections from the translations from the Polytech Society and yeah, it had a number of chapters from the Dhammapada, I think in Max Muller's translation, as well as selections from Mahayana Sutras and then some from later works in China, Japan, something from Tibet, you know, just a broad anthology of Buddhist texts. Um, One thing you, you say that the sort of thought of becoming a monk came into your mind. Um, I'm just always really touched by those, that moment in someone's life. Um, is there any specific like moment you could describe in detail where it really kind of came, where it was really decided for you? And, and what was that moment? You know, it wasn't like I had to struggle with the question, should I become a monk or not? Just, as I said, when I started to read about Buddhism, it seemed like the natural thing to do if you wanted to follow the Dharma full time is to become a monk. Um, but it wasn't the case that as soon as I met the Vietnamese monk at Claremont Graduate Residence Hall, the thought came, immediately let me become a monk <laughs> since still I had some you know at the same time that there was that interest and the wish to learn more about Buddhism and to practice there was also the sort of skeptic sitting in the back saying is this really true or maybe it's just one more fabrication of the human mind unable to adjust the kind of another form of escapism, unable to adapt to the hard reality that we're just conglomerates of material particles that at death will just disintegrate into dead matter. Um, but once I started to practice meditation with his under his guidance and started to experience the benefits, just after a few months, about three months, I think, then I decided that I want to become a monk myself. Now at that time, this was the early 70s or even the late 60s. This was, no, this was 1967. Yeah, okay, late 60s, um, pretty much you did make the decision that to be able to fill this goal of becoming yeah. a monk, that you had to go to Asia. And, and now, I mean, all three of us are currently living in America. I ordained yeah. in America. And, you know, what do you think has, has changed? I mean, if... If you had just, if you were a young man um, right now and you were seeing these things, do you think that you would have felt so strongly that you need to go to Asia or do you think um, you would have tried to find a place in America to ordain? 
it's really very hard to say because I think I like Asian culture. <laughs> um, but it, it's so hard to say. But I mean, what certainly what has changed is that first, Buddhism has become much, of course, countless times much more widespread in, in the United States and more broadly in the West than back in those days. Um, and now there are functioning monasteries here in the West, in the United States. Whereas back at that time, 1967, there were maybe some Zen centers getting started. It was the one in San Francisco. I think the only Theravada temple in the US at that time might have been the Washington Buddhist Vihara, which I think was set up about 1966. Yeah, other than that, I don't think there were any other Theravada temples or centers in the US. Liking Asian culture and uh, myself as well. I mean, I lived in Thailand for six years yeah. or so, and there's a lot to be said for uh, actually being a monk in a Buddhist country. Yeah, um, you're just supported on not just a physical level and a very tangible yeah. way that you can see every every morning, every day in so many ways, but even just on a kind of psychological level. You know, everybody's rooting for you. You're part of the team. Yeah. Um, do you think? Um, that for someone who does or, ordain in America, you know, do you think there are um, there are drawbacks in that the monks who ordain in America just don't get to experience that that kind of group support from the wider culture? Or? Well, I, I what what I understand is that monks who ordain through Ab Abayagiri do get to go to Thailand and spend time in Thailand. So that exposes them to the Asian culture. Um, yes, certainly there are these advantages of spending at least some time in Asia. Though also what would happen if one sort of sends down roots in Asia maybe one becomes too much disconnected from one's own, own, own culture. One day, um, I'm curious, since Vatican, or since the Reformation, the West, or specifically America, has lacked a strong monastic figure, yeah. Uh, yeah. replaced that spiritual archetype. So I'm curious how you think that's, what what we've turned to to fill that role in the absence of monastics, both Christian and otherwise, and how that lack has affected us in terms of our culture and history or economy. I know it's a gigantic question, but I'm curious what comes up when you think about how that lack of a spiritual like role um, has affected us in the long term. Maybe phrase the question again, put it. At... Do you think that cultures that have a monastic form mm -hmm. embedded in them and as part of them mm -hmm. um, operate fundamentally differently from a culture which doesn't? And, and how do they operate differently? How has, how do you feel that it's lack of a monastic role or a, a monastic figure has affected American culture over? The yeah, th these are big questions. I know, sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think what's happened in Christianity is that maybe because, especially of the Protestant Reformation, the idea is that salvation comes through faith alone, or in some versions, faith and good works, but the idea that one embarks upon a full-time spiritual quest falls away. And even in Catholicism, the adoption of the monastic life is regarded as a very special and very rare vocation, mm -hmm. which is a pursuit of an individual's way of, of sort of pursuing 
and fulfilling their relationship with God, but it's not considered to be in any way a precondition or a strong, necessarily a strong basis for salvation. Whereas in Buddhism, the way to ultimate liberation or salvation is through a disciplined life dedicated to the contemplative quest. And so that virtually requires a monastic system of organization to provide the optimal conditions for that dedicated quest for the contemplative life. And that has an impact on, I would say, on the whole society, particularly, I mean, in countries in which Buddhism is the dominant religion, because then it instills in the entire society and culture a respect and reverence for those who dedicate their life to the spiritual quest. And in theory, at least, they become the ideal model even for lay people at least to show respect and reverence for the those who adopt the monastic life and to support them. And so in theory, you get a society which is structured around a relationship of mutual support between monastics and lay people, where the lay people provide the monastics with their material requisites and the monastics provide the lay people with Dhamma teachings and also with the models of a disciplined life of renunciation. So I say in theory that sort of orients the culture and the society towards renunciation. And I keep on using the phrase in theory because in practice it's very, very different. I mean, it's very difficult for societies in which the great majority of people, even if they are just might just be nominally Buddhist, but still very much their minds are governed by worldly uh, desires and pursuits. You, you point to a pretty fundamental imbalance that you've spoken of in a paper you wrote for the Bhavana Society in 2006, or a talk you gave, yeah. where you talk about this dynamic in the US, how um, without the elements of faith and right view being emphasized. And mm -hmm. since Buddhism has been sort of presented in America as sort of this, the core of it just being sort of this mindfulness, um, mm -hmm. bare bones, then the monastic form and the lay, uh, the lay form yeah. or the lay lacquer held is more or less completely equal in terms of um, mm -hmm. progressing along the path. Yeah. Um, so how do you see... Um, what is a healthy route forward for Buddhism in the U.S. in terms of coming to it? Because I've also lived in those Eastern cultures, and, and in this paper you mentioned that sometimes those roles get too crystallized as well, and no. lay people leave all the spiritual development to the monastics. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there's something healthy in the West, but how do you yeah. see how do you see things coming to a, a more appropriate balance in, in America with monastics and laity in general? You know, I don't think in the U.S. that we could ever have, and perhaps we shouldn't have, a monastic system similar to the type of monastic system that's established in Asia, where it's considered that where, where the basic full, uh, function of the monastic is to maintain of temples in order for, for the purpose of maintaining the Buddhist religious identity. And so I think it's natural and normal that there will be far fewer monastics in the West and that those who feel, who enter upon the monastic life in the West will be those who truly feel a strong calling, strong sense of vocation towards the monastic life. Whereas in Asia, many people, especially men, enter monastic life just because it's maybe a tradition in their family, or because they see monastic life as the opportunity to get a good education, or because it confers some kind of social status. Um, and also what happens in Asia 
as you mentioned, is that lay people don't often don't think that they have an obligation to undertake a very strong and serious commitment to the practice of the Dharma. Whereas here in the West, many lay people become interested in Buddhism and take up Buddhist practice. And what's a little bit puzzling, and I don't know the solution to this, you see in, in Asia, if somebody gets seriously interested in the Dhamma, they'll think the ones that one goes to are the monks, because they're the ones who are sort of steeped in the practice and the study, who have devoted their lives to it. And so if you want to learn the Dhamma, you go to them. But what's taking place in the West, or at least in the United States, is that a lot of people think, who become interested in Buddhism, think, well, the monastic way of life is just so remote from anything that I have personal experience of, and so different from my way of life. But we have so many lay teachers who have devoted a lot of time to practice of meditation, some probably have done quite a lot of reading in the Dharma and are very skillful in being able to explain Buddhist teachings in a way that are adapted and adjusted to the needs of lay people and can understand the lay audience better because they have experience of the lay life. <laughs> so that seems like a fairly valid criticism or line of reasoning, Bhante. How would you respond to that? Or what would you... I, 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 didn't, I didn't think of this as a criticism, either of the monastics mm -hmm. or of the lay people. It's just a, a process of development that is currently underway. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know offhand the solution to this, but I remember when I gave that talk at the Bhavana Society, Achan Amaro was, was present. And we had a little discussion about this after my talk. And he said that, it, you know, he finds that it's just the way it is that there will be uh, amongst the Americans involved with Buddhism, there are some who just take to lay teachers and have no interest in learning from monastic teachers. And then there'll be like other people who Maybe they start off with the lay teachers, but once they make the contact with monastic teachers, then they take to the monastery and they want to learn just from the monastic teachers. And so a kind of divide is open between these two streams of those who become involved with Dhamma practice, those who sort of naturally gravitate towards lay teachers and the style of exposition amongst lay lay teachers and those who naturally gravitate towards, towards the monasteries and monastic teachers and the style of presentation by monastic teachers. Perhaps this is, maybe it's rooted in vasanas or mental formations from previous lives, <laughs> or maybe just from the social and cultural conditioning in this life itself. You, you bring up I mean, a really... You know, yeah, I, I just should say, you know, maybe back in the 1980s, I actually did some, attended some courses at the Insight Meditation Society in Barry, Massachusetts. And I like Joseph Goldstein's teachings very much because he was very straight on target with this presentation of the Dharma. And since then, I haven't since those days, I haven't like listened very much to recordings of teacher of teachings by lay teachers. So I don't know very much the style of teaching, but what I would assume in order to make the Dharma sort of palatable to people living in lay life and committed to lay life is that there'll be shifts in emphasis mm -hmm. and even shifts in interpretation and presentation so that the, what I would consider the hard core of the Buddha's teaching, the relinquishment of all points of attachment aimed at ultimate liberation into the asankata dhatu, the unconditioned element of Nibbana <laughs> would be sort of put on a back burner or even hidden <laughs> at, 
completely discarded in favor of things like you know experiencing more fully the here and now living with deep appreciation of our lives i remember a phrase a famous meditation lay meditation teacher has a book in which he says after when one becomes awakened then one can fully participate in the dance of life <laughs> using phrases like that <laughs> Whereas for <laughs> we're not good dancers. <laughs> yeah, for one who one who embarks on the life of uh, on the monastic life is one who is sort of departing from the depths of life. <laughs> I mean, you you point to a really fundamental tension that's been at the heart of, say, with the Catholic Church with Vatican II, where they tried to make the monastics more relatable by getting rid of the habit and the robe and, and just really trying to sort of downplay that monastic form. Um, mm. You point to a really interesting tension, like are, um, how are monastics relevant in that case? And how much do we adjust ourselves and our teachings and our form uh, to the culture in order to speak to a wider audience? Or is our role more to um, just be uh, sort of uh, hold sort of the essential or more orthodox teachings um, as others bridge those inter interpretational and cu cultural divides. What do you see uh, as yeah, our role? I think I think certainly monastics have to uphold, maintain, and present what we call the orthodox teaching or the canonical teaching. Though I wonder whether the kind of model that is typical in Asia will really work as successfully in the United States. So like, what is the model of preaching and teaching in Asia? The way I've encountered it, say in Sri Lanka, so the monastics will encourage the lay people to make offerings, maybe the primary mode of teaching is to practice dana, giving, primarily is making offerings to the, they wouldn't say to give to me or to give to us, but to make offerings and practice generosity to support the Mahasanga, the great monastic community, and to observe precepts with the ideal of acquiring merit for the purpose of being reborn in the, heaven, in the heavenly realm with the aspiration, the hope that through accumulating sufficient merit during the time of Maitreya Buddha, one will be able to encounter Maitreya Buddha face to face, <laughs> learn the Dhamma from his golden mouth and then attain the paths and fruits through the guidance of Maitreya Buddha. <laughs> so I don't know whether that would go off uh, well with an American audience um, and so what we do is sort of present the kind of dark and, and we can see that that style of teaching is actually in conformity with pretty much with the Buddha's model of teaching in the suttas when he's teaching lay people it's basically to observe precepts to practice dana, sila and to um but also bhavana, different forms of bhavana, but more emphasizing the practices of the six recollections, the anusati, and maybe the brahma vihara, but also developing insight. But when he's teaching insight, also even for the lay people, it's aimed at reaching the magapala, the paths and fruits. Whereas now, say, I would assume that like the people who have come through the programs of training as Dharma teachers through some of the major meditation centers, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, are not teaching for the purpose of encouraging practitioners to aim for the paths and fruits, but more to develop like mindfulness, and the principles of insight maybe of impermanence or at least anatta in order to 
be able to live more fully in the present and to sort of dance with the flow of experience and to sort of dance with the flow of impermanence and maintaining balance and equanimity you know, amidst the changing fluctuating conditions of life. But I don't know whether the teaching that coming out of the lay teachers who have been trained in that in those systems are putting stress on nibida, viraga, vimuti, you know, disenchantment, dispassion, liberation. It's so so much of, of your monastic life has been like giving, giving back to mm -hmm. the larger society, whether it's translation work all yeah. the translation work that you've done or if it's working at DPS or if it's through the uh, Buddhist global yeah. relief yeah. Um, and that's amazing work what do you do you feel that there's still a place for like the quiet forest monk who doesn't really have much of any interaction with society who is um, in, in America in particular um, which is can be quite uh, yeah that that model of someone who is seemingly just totally stepping back from society is just an anathema to the, the Protestant work ethic. Do you do you feel that 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 role of the the forest monk who is not giving back in any kind of um, discernible or measurable way? Do you think it's still valid in America? Yes, yeah, certainly, certainly, and I think like the monks who are living quietly in the forest, maybe not doing active promotion of the Dhamma are still serving as we call inspiring model of dedication and renunciation and commitment to the practice. But also what I would think maybe what is necessary in the United States, please don't take this as a personal criticism, but it seems that the model of monasticism which has taken root in the United States is that of the forest monastic tradition. But what, what is in an Asian Buddhist country like Sri Lanka, what serves as the base that enables a forest monastic tradition to operate is the existence of urban temples and monasteries, which in which the monks have contact with the lay people and provide teachings to the lay people and provide social services to the lay people. And so it would seem to me that a broader conception of what monastic life involves would be desirable in this country. So when people think here, because they've always been exposed to the forest traditions, either stemming from, well, actually it's, they're all coming from, from Thailand. <laughs> primarily through the lineage of Achan Cha. So they think you know, to become a Buddhist monk means necessarily you become a forest monk. But let's say what's serving like the Sri Lankan Buddhists here in the United States are the Viharas like in Washington, New York, Staten Island, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Los Angeles, um, Bonte, I, um, I think you make a really good point, and it's something I've seen born out in our own tradition is the new generation of monastics, myself included. Um, there is a sense of wanting to, say, branch out a bit and, you know, find new ways of embodying this form, some of which yeah. are more involved. Um, yeah. And yet I've also seen the, and I think that was the case in the Buddhist time as well, you're right, there are these you know, the monastic system in these countries is, is broad and yeah. inclusive of many different forms. Yeah. I, I've also seen when, say, the Vinaya um, uh, yeah. is, uh, the monastic code is compromised too much. I've yeah. seen the monastic form really um, dulled and its power really softened. And yeah. so, but my sense is that that's not, one a monastic might still exist say closer to the lay people and city centers yeah um but still maintain that 
essential core of what it means to be a monastic. So, yeah, yeah. It, it, so what's the essential core? How do we make, still be good monks, even if we're not forest monks? You know, what's yeah. how do we adapt and not lose? I think certainly one has to uphold the fundamental principles of the Vinaya. So I think within an urban environment, the need for some flexibility is, is there. And I'm somewhat flexible here, so I'm not in the Theravadan forest monastery, so I have to be flexible in certain respects. Um, but I'd say a dedication to one's internal development and practice is, is sort of the core. And too often within this, the village temples and city temples it, that I've seen in Sri Lanka, that core gets lost. But I've seen in amongst the Sri Lankan monks, in the United States, um, in city and in city temples, very very good quality, very like dedicated to both presenting the Dhamma to others and maintaining the traditions, the ceremonies and rituals which are necessary for their for their the people of their own culture, but also dedicated to their own practice. Maybe not as intensively as within the as, as possible within the forest, but they maintain that dedication to the practice. And, yeah, especially uh, like the the generation now, maybe of, of Sri Lankan monks in the U.S. in their maybe late forties and their fifties, I say very very good, very respectable monks. And, and one thing you're pointing to a bit, Bonte, is the holding up, say, in this tension between lay, the lay teaching style and the monastic, yeah. uh, what's embodied in monastic teaching is the emphasis or at least um, emphasis on the transcendent, perhaps. Yeah. And I understand that in the past 50 or 60 years, there has been much more emphasis on, say, mindfulness and just uh, imminent happiness in the present life as embodied in these wholesome mind states yeah, and yeah, yeah. development do you feel like with the world's current um movement into climate collapse various difficulties do you think that image or importance of the transcendent is is being is being raised up at all again is there a new importance to it um do you see people being drawn more towards ordination say based on that in the u.s or do you think there's any change in these past few years that you've seen well what what i would say is that because of things like the disruption of the of the natural climate and various social problems that we have income inequality, a lot of poverty, even in this country, and a lot of de deluded thinking on the part of people. I think that there's more need for Buddhists to deliver a message of, we call this an imminent message rather than the transcendent message to explain those principles of Dharma that are necessary to create a rational, wholesome, Integ integral society rather than just turning our back on a society that's veering ever ever closer to total collapse and disintegration and thinking I'm just going to flee this and enter into the transcendent dimension of, of <laughs> nirvana but we have to uphold and, and promote those principles of the Dharma that are conducive to establishing a sane society that has bet that can be mm. truly healthy and wholesome and beneficial to the great masses of people. It, like promoting such values as greater social and economic justice, uh, environmental, uh, environmental sustainability. It, it makes a lot of sense to me then your your recent project on the teachings of communal harmony that you you published yeah actually the way that book came about i didn't have the original impetus to compile that book on my own but after the end of the ethnic conflict in sri lanka 
which ended, I think it was 2009. There's an institute at Columbia University, the Institute for Peace Studies, something like that. They said that they wanted some teachings from, from, from the Buddhist text to present to monks in Sri Lanka, teachings that will promote, conduce to social harmony and peaceful relations amongst different communities. And they asked me if I could provide them with some find some text that would be relevant to, to their project. And so then I started just looking through the, through the Nikayas and made up a little outline and then started putting in one text under this heading, more text under that heading. And then before long, I had this collection, which I sent to them, to the people at Columbia University. And then about a month later, after I submitted, the, submitted that, my friend, his name is Alan Sinauki. He lives, he's the, now, now he's the abbot of the Berkeley Zen, Zen Center. Uh, but he was doing work in Myanmar, in Burma, trying to bring different communities together. And so he called me up and he asked whether I could provide him with any texts that would be relevant to promoting communal harmony in Myanmar. <laughs> and I told him, I have just the collection for you. And I sent him that collection and he had it translated into Burmese. <laughs> so it was first published in Burmese, but he told me this would be useful to have published in the United States. So then I wrote an introduction to it and introductions to the chapters and then submitted it to Wisdom Publications and then they published it. You've been living for the last almost 20 years here in America in, in Chinese Buddhist Mahayana monasteries. Um, have you found that there are any aspects or themes that come up in either traditional Mahayana cultures or, um, or in Mahayana texts, which you found as a good kind of support and uh, a pertinent for Theravada teachings, which are, are more emphasized on this this transcendent i mean you read at least when i was reading the when i do read the pali suttas i mean there's just so much about uh, you know seclusion and um yeah, yeah just yeah, one's own welfare being mostly paramount um have you, what what teachings have you taken from the maybe the, maybe the northern schools i think in some respects you could say that the mahayana has given more prominence to an aspect that we find in the early suttas, which often is not sufficiently emphasized theoretically, but I would say it's embodied within the Theravada traditions. And that is mm -hmm. one finds often when the Buddha is teaching, he'll say, for your own good, you should do this, and for the good of others, you should do this. And so maybe in theory, sort of the way, I'm not even sure this applies to the Theravada schools, but some of the other early schools developed, putting more emphasis on seeking one's own good at the ex expense of the good of others, whereas the Mahayana through the way they've developed the bodhisattva ideal has put more emphasis on promoting the good of others. But I say in theory this has happened because the way I've seen Buddhism in, expressed and embodied in Sri Lanka, there's a lot of emphasis on from the monks on promoting the good of others particularly amongst the town and city monasteries. And it's not just through like performing ceremonies and rituals for the lay people, but say in a village, the sort of social center for village activities will be the temple. And if the people in the village need something to be done, like they need improvements in the road connecting the village to a nearby city, the one that they go to 
to be the sort of intermediary between the people and the government authority will be the, the temple, the monks at the temple. And so the monks will serve. Yeah, this role of sort of being the advocate for the welfare of the people in the village. And also the monks have very often they serve as teachers in the schools, even in the secular schools. And so the monks get become involved in a lot of altruistic activities. And also on the other side, what I've discovered now, what is taking place, particularly amongst the Buddhists in Taiwan, is that there's been like a whole wave now of interest in going back and finding the, the oldest stratum of Buddhist teachings. In fact, sort of what got me maybe connected with Chinese monasteries, when I came back to the United States, first, when I first came back, I was staying in the Sri Lankan temple, the New York Buddhist Vihara, but they had shortage of rooms. So I was staying in a storeroom. So I had to find another place. The Basa was coming, I had to find another place. And then I went to some Buddhist function where there are different representatives. And there was an old Chinese monk who had a Chinese Canadian translator. And the Chinese, his, his Chinese Canadian translator knew of me. You know, when he heard my name, he knew of me. And he told me that they were all studying the Nikayas. <laughs> and then he invited me to come to their monastery on my way back to New York. And that turned out to be Bodhi, the place called Bodhi Monastery in New Jersey. And I found that the residents there, the monastics, and there was a lay scholar from Taiwan there, like they were studying the Sangyutta Nikaya. And so that um, it has struck, it made a deep impression on me that there was this interest in sort of going back and finding the early stratum of the Buddhist teachings. Our time is uh, running up. We had a, a couple of kind of rapid fire questions if you were up for those. Um, maybe one of them is, uh, if you, do you have three books that you would recommend for um, say an American Buddhist, um, yeah, be, maybe beginning to be interested in uh, in monasticism. <laughs> or we can broaden it. We can broaden it to uh, three books in general. Do you have uh, three books that you could recommend for anyone? Are there three all-purpose books that you could recommend? Or is... For somebody who's newly starting to get interested in Buddhism? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what I would recommend for somebody just starting to become interested in monasticism. Um, but always what often what I recommend, though it's a bit of a sort of rationalized adaptation of Buddhist teachings, but it's served, it's been highly influential in getting people involved with Buddhism, and that is Walpula Rahul is what the Buddha taught. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't like to sort of promote my own, my own books, <laughs> but I do like to recommend, like, I have a little book called The Noble Eightfold Path, which explains the eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. And then... That's a very good recommendation, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got started on that one. And then for somebody who wants to learn more about the Satipatthana practice, maybe Bhikkhu Analeo's book called The Direct Path to Realization. It's a sort of detailed explanation of the Satipatthana Sutta. Do you have one uh, non-Buddhist book that you'd recommend 
fun day, just that you've read, read as a hobby that you wouldn't mind uh, sharing with us? It's a bit radical. <laughs> it's a book by a Canadian philosopher called John McMurty. It's called Value Wars. I th think it's subtitled Life Values Versus the Market Economy, or could it be the Market Economy Versus Life Values? But I'd say it's a critically important book for understanding what is taking place more broadly in our world, in our society, how it lays out in detail how market values have sort of taken over the entire scheme, the dynamics that are running our economy and our society, even to the point where they're crushing life itself on this planet. Mm -hmm. And then he lays out sort of an alternative pathway towards a revival of true values that are truly conducive to the flourishing of life. And, and Bonte, another, sorry, these are questions I've wanted to ask for a long time. Um, I've heard a teacher say that it's strange that in the Pali Suttas, you never have a monk asking the Buddha how he became the Buddha. Um, and and the idea that, no, go, go on. Oh, well, the idea is that maybe that the, some, when the schism between the Mahayana and the Theravada yeah. manifested, that they're, the Theravada redactors kind of maybe left out certain teachings that would have um, said that, because it is strange that it doesn't come up often. Do you have any thoughts on that? I was curious. I've actually thought a lot about that. And yeah, I, I, I wrote a paper called, I think it's called Arhats, Buddhas, and Bodhisattvas, or Arhats, Bodhisattvas, and Buddhas, something like that, in which I present that exact same question or, or problem, why we don't see in the early texts anybody come to the Buddha and say, Bhante, what is the practices through which you became a Samasambuddha, and how can a person undertake those practices? But then they do, I mean, they do emerge within the Pali Canon in the work called Buddha Vangsa and, and uh, Ch Charya Pitaka. Mm. But those are regarded as having arisen in a somewhat later period, you know, maybe a couple of centuries after the older stratum of the teachings. Mm. And so some, I've, I've seen some scholars say that, well, because those we don't find any teachings on a bodhisattva path in the oldest stratum of the Nikayas, so that's a later construction. But the Buddha probably just, you know, didn't deliberately follow a specific path to Buddhahood, but, you know, just attained it on his own. But it seems to me a bit Odd that it's part of the cosmic process, according even to the according to the earliest texts, that periodically, over long long periods, some of some Buddhas arise, and when they arise, they all teach the same thing, and they all have bodies with the same characteristics. Mm -hmm. So it would seem that there should be definitely like a course of practice that culminates in Buddhahood. Maybe, um, so do you have another question? I've got one, and then would you want to ask the final one? And... No, it's fine. Nemo and I'm curious what you think is the most important issue in American Buddhism at, at present, something which we need to, to emphasize. What is the most important issue? Yeah, in American Buddhism. I'd say probably the most important issue or challenge is maybe preserving the authentic integrity of the Dhamma against the tendency to accommodate Buddhist teachings just to meet the 
imminent or mundane needs of people living in the world, like to lose sight of of the Buddha Dhamma as a path to world transcending liberation and the danger that it will just turn into a way to live maybe a more, of course, it will be a wholesome life, but just a life of purely human flourishing rather than transcendent realization. And that, well, is, yeah. a ten yeah, that is a tendency that takes place maybe in the mindfulness movement and then you have the development of secular Buddhism, which I don't, you know, I could see how many people will find meaning and value in putting in brackets, teachings like karma and rebirth and trying to uncover those aspects of the Buddha Dharma that are conducive to human well-being and flourishing here and now. But if one rejects or completely neglects those world transcending aspects of the Buddha Dharma, then when Buddhism is going to lose that flavor of vimuti rasa, the taste of liberation, and become just the taste of accommodation. <laughs> A pseudo-Buddhist quietism. I yeah, it's... yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bhante, that we know we've taken a lot of your time. And I, I on that note, I really want to thank you for all you've done in terms of preserving mm -hmm. that core mm -hmm and those transcendent aspects. And, and certainly you played a huge role in mm. both my own, Ajin Kovilo and, and many monastics and other practitioners mm. lives and trajectories um, along this path. So I'm, I'm so grateful. Um, thank you very much. Okay, okay. Thank you for the opportunity to May we share some thoughts. Okay, okay. Okay, Abhivadanu Sivi Sandi Changu Dapachai no Chetaro Dabla Padati Ayuvanu Sukam Balang. I can clip this off if we if we want. Okay, okay. Okay, you could ask it, yeah. Um, although you can tell us if you want us to include it. Um, if you could if science discovered a way to revive the Tyrannosaurus Rex, should we do it? This is a question Sam Harris asked at the end of every interview, and we thought we would ask you just to get the Dharma perspective. But we didn't want to put it on the actual recording because we're embarrassed. <laughs> to revive the Tyrosaurus Rex? The the, di Rex. the dinosaur. Yeah. So yeah, like get there. Should DNA. it be done if we could do it? I guess this is leading into the ethical question. Should we do anything that can be done? <laughs> Pro probably it shouldn't be done. <laughs> But I guess a Tyrus, ty, Tyrus, Tyrannosaurus Rex would then start destroying everything in sight, you know? <laughs> it's Thank a little bit it. maybe like, like asking if we can detonate all of the nuclear weapons that we have in our, in our arsenal, should we do so? Certainly not. <laughs> Good. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay. Maybe maybe we could res resuscitate one of them and keep it in a in a zoo, <laughs> but but uh, not a male and a female because then they'll come together and reproduce and then we'll have a whole bunch of rexes taking over the planet. Should should we cut this part out of the recording, Bonte, or do you want us to keep it in there? <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. <laughs>